Good afternoon. A uh, few things at the top. Uh, yesterday, the department submitted to Congress and publicly released the International Narcotics Control Strategy Report, or INCSER. The INCSER is the department's, Department of State's annual country-by-country -country report that describes the efforts of governments to address all aspects of illicit global drug trade and associated money laundering. The illicit drug trade remains one of the most pernicious threats to U.S. public health and security, as well as to international stability. The United States has a critical national interest in keeping dangerous illegal drugs from reaching our citizens, and the INCSER highlights the importance of working with, this, uh, with the source in transit countries to reduce supplies of these drugs. Continuing global efforts to reduce drug demand remains the most effective and cost-efficient means to achieve this goal. Over the past year, the COVID-19 pandemic had a significant impact on drug control and drug treatment efforts around the world. The pandemic uh, contributed uh, to the lethal effects of drug use and also hampered counter-drug efforts as governments diverted resources to other public health needs. Law enforcement responders were among the hardest hit, with lives tragically lost due to the virus. The United States recognizes that political will is the most important determinant of success in a global fight to achieve a reduction in drug production, and we will remain committed to working with like-minded governments to reduce illicit drug flows and drug use. Moving over to Yemen now. Based on the recent complex Nasrallah attacks, including those on Saudi Arabia this past weekend and even again last night, the United States is imposing sanctions on two senior Ansrallah militant leaders, Mansour al-Sa'adi and Ahmed Ali Hassan al-Hamzi. These are in addition to the three Ansrallah leaders that remained sanctioned when the group's designation uh, were revoked last month. As the Secretary has said, we will continue to closely monitor the activities of Ansrallah and its leaders, and we are actively identifying additional measures to promote accountability for the, uh, for the perpetuation of violence in Yemen. And finally, on Russia. Today, the Department of State joined Treasury and Commerce in a coordinated whole of government action against Russian government entities and Russian officials for attempting to assassinate opposition figure Alexei Navalny with a chemical weapon in Russia in August of 2020 and for his subsequent arrest and imprisonment. The heinous poisoning of Mr. Navalny preceded his arrest and imprisonment on politically motivated grounds. It is clear that Russian officials targeted Mr. Navalny for his activism and his efforts to reveal uncomfortable truths about Russian officials' corruption and to give voice to Russian citizens' legitimate grievances with their government and its policies. We are exercising our authorities to send a clear signal that Russia's use of chemical weapons and human rights abuses have severe consequences. Any use of chemical weapons anywhere, at any time, by anyone, under any circumstance is unacceptable and it contravenes international norms. We also welcome the action taken by the EU earlier today to impose costs on Russia under its own new global human rights authorities. These actions today demonstrate that there will be accountability for the use of chemical weapons and actions that violate international norms and abuse human rights. The United States calls upon Russia to comply with its obligations under the Chemical Weapons Convention and to declare and destroy its chemical weapons program under international verification. We reiterate our call for the Russian government to immediately and to unconditionally release Mr. Navalny. With that, um, Matt, happy to turn it over to you. Right. Uh, thanks. Uh, before I get to questions, I just wanted to um, make a very brief kind of opening little thing. And it is just to say that it has not gone unnoticed by the people who cover this building, the people in this room, people in Washington, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, people out around the world that you have gotten up here every day, four days a week at least, and one day on, on the phone to, uh, you know, try to explain or defend if needed administration policy and I just want to make the point that uh, it, it's it's appreciated whether you're successful in <laughs> what your goal is or not it is um, it's a welcome change and I just want to I, I just want to make that thank clear. you very much thank you very much everyone we'll see you tomorrow <laughs> for the record right now on to the question so why is this administration's foreign policy so far an abject and epic colossal failure no that's not my question um, Mike, I, I know that people want to talk about Russia, but I want to just start with Yemen. Isn't 
Uh, so I've been after you on this very subject of Yemen and the leaders of the, the Houthi leadership for more than two weeks now. And you continue to say that you left the three Nasrallah leaders on uh, the uh, on, on the sanctions list, but yet you removed them from the terrorism sanctions list. So now that you, um, and, and you said that you tried to make that same point again today by saying that you left them, you had left them on the, uh, on the other list. But doesn't the designation of these two additional people today suggest that you're at least having second thoughts or you think that it may have been a mistake to remove the three other ones from the terrorism list in the first place because the situation has gotten worse, not better. And so if it was intended as a, uh, an overture to try to get them to moderate their behavior, it hasn't worked. Matt, I would take the two additional designations today as a sign that we will continue to hold Houthi leaders, Ansarallah leaders, to account for their reprehensible conduct, uh, including their continued attacks uh, against Saudi Arabia. I've said this previously. Uh, you referenced this. Uh, but the three Houthi leaders you referenced have been, and they still are, subject to U.S. and U.N. sanctions. Any property they have subject to U.S. jurisdiction is blocked. That was the case before. It remains the case now. U.S. persons cannot do business with them. That was the case before. That remains the case now. The practical implications for the three Houthi leaders you mentioned, the, the three, um, uh, uh, not including the two we added today, but today with the two, now five, they, uh, uh, the implications for them are similar uh, whether they're designated under our authorities related to Yemen, which we used in the case today of these additional two, or our authorities related to terrorism. Uh, I think the point is that we are not focused on a label. We are focused on taking steps uh, to end the conflict in Yemen through a political track. And importantly, this gets back to the revocation of the broad designation uh, to alleviate the suffering of the people of Yemen to alleviate the humanitarian suffering that has afflicted this country for so many years now. I've, I've cited the stat before, but it's so important. 80% of Yemen's civilian population lives under Houthi control. When Ansrallah was subject to a broad designation, it was the 80% of, of Yemen's people that uh, suffered as a result. We want and we will continue to hold Ansrallah's leadership to account. We did that today with two additional leaders, uh, Ansrallah leaders who are now subject to um, sanctions under uh, our Yemen authorities. We, at the same time, uh, do not and will not do anything uh, that adds to the humanitarian suffering of the Yemeni people. We can do two things at once. We can hold Ansrallah's leaders to account uh, while not adding to the humanitarian suffering of the people of Yemen. So is there a metric by which you can demonstrate that the removal of the Houthis broadly from the FTO list and for the three leaders from the terrorism list, not from the other list, but is there a metric by which you can, uh, you can show to us, that demonstrate to us that the humanitarian situation in Yemen has improved since the administration's decisions? Well, Matt, we are... Or has it that gotten worse, which is a lot what a lot of people think, I, including I'm, the UN. I'm, I'm not confident, and in fact, I'm uh, quite certain uh, we can't uh, measure humanitarian impact over the course of hours or days. Uh, it's been well, it's just been it's been just a couple now. weeks now um, since that well, broad designation uh, was lifted. I think we're going to be looking. To anything we're going to be looking at trends. We're going to be looking at trends over time. Obviously, there was an important uh, funding conference yesterday. The United States pledged nearly 200 million dollars. We've encouraged the rest of the world, uh, including uh, our partners in the region, to raise their ambition when it comes to the humanitarian suffering of uh, the Yemeni people. I think the other metric, if you will, that we're looking at uh, is uh, measured in our efforts to promote a uh, political solution to this horrific conflict in Yemen. 
Uh, and we look at that in terms of what Tim Lenderking, the special envoy, is doing uh, in the region. He is now on his second uh, trip there uh, in just a few short weeks of having held that position, um, working closely with the UN special envoy for Yemen, Martin Griffiths, working closely uh, with governments in the region uh, to try and bring a sustainable, durable uh, end to this conflict in Yemen. Again, that's not something we can measure in hours. Uh, it's probably not something we can measure in days, but it is something we uh, are prioritizing at every level okay. to well, achieve progress on uh, going forward. Can you measure it in any, in any aspect at all, whether it's gotten better or worse in the two weeks that you guys are, I, two and a half weeks? Because I, I, I get it, yeah, you, you appointed someone He's a good guy. He's an accomplished diplomat. He's been there, he's now been there twice, but you know that's just a lot of talk. And a donor conference, well, that's great. But you know what? Uh, a bunch of people speaking virtually from air-conditioned rooms in Washington and Berlin and London. To I mean, it goes back to like the Syria political talks. A bunch of people hanging out in Swiss hotels, yakking away, doesn't affect the situation on the ground necessarily. Matt, so I, what can you, can, just what, if anything, can you point to to suggest that since you've lifted the FTO designation and the other designations, it has gotten better for the people in Yemen who are suffering so horribly? Matt, we lifted that broad designation in the first instance so as not to add to the humanitarian suffering of the people of Yemen. I don't disagree with you in, run, in one respect. No one is satisfied uh, with where we are in Yemen. No one is satisfied with the status quo. That is precisely why, as one of his first acts in the foreign policy realm, President Biden appointed Tim Linderking uh, to a position that had not existed before, to a position as special envoy uh, for the conflict in Yemen. That is precisely why Tim Linderking, in his few weeks on the job, has already been in the region twice. It is precisely why he has met on multiple occasions with the UN Special Envoy, okay, but, you know, why he has continued to meet with uh, regional uh, partners. Th this, this progress, uh, we are doing everything we can, uh, and there is a lot we can do, um, number one, to, uh, uh, to reverse some of the measures, uh, including the revocation that we've talked about that added to the suffering of the Yemeni people, just as then we then go about the business of prioritizing a political uh, uh, solution to this conflict. That is what Mr. Linder King is doing. That is what the president has prioritized. That is what Secretary uh, Blinken has prioritized. And that's something uh, where we will measure progress, not in minutes, uh, uh, not in days, um, but going forward, it's something where we expect we will be able to find progress sure because Tim, we're investing in it quite heavily. I'm sure Tim appreciates all the confidence that you have in him, but his appointment is not like, you know, some grand, you know, big thing. I mean, it's a one guy, and great, I get, get that he's doing a, a good job. He's a good diplomat. He knows what he's doing. But the appointment of one guy is not, it, it, it's, you know, it's not a game changer. And you seem to be saying that it is. So anyway, I'll stop. Please. And on this, on Tim Linderkin, has he met with or spoken with any Houthi representative while in the region? Does he plan to? Is that something? Uh, so uh, we expect to happen soon. Sorry, is it is something that something we should expect to happen soon? Well, um, we certainly have ways um, to get messages to the Houthis if we need to. Uh, there is no doubt uh, in their minds about where the United States stands uh, when it comes to their conduct, when it comes to our expectations of Houthi leadership. Uh, they saw that again today um, with the two designations uh, we announced. Uh, Tim Linderking, uh, he is traveling throughout the region. Again, this is his second trip. Uh, he's met with the UN Special Envoy. He's met with uh, regional um, uh, partners there. Um, and he will continue to do so uh, in the conduct of that diplomacy that we think is necessary uh, to help bring about a political solution to this conflict in Yemen. Yes. Thank you very much. Well, it's from America Russian Service. And uh, I will join, colleague, in gratitude. Your work is outstanding. Thank you. I really. appreciate that. Yeah, uh, I have. I didn't say that. <laughs> Let the record show that uh, Matt Lee also said we were outstanding. <laughs> Uh, but before, are you going to ask about uh, Yemen or any, something else? No, no, no. Or my, was, was that your only statement, which I'm fine with, too? No, 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 no. <laughs> my, my questions, of course, were about Russia. Russia. Does anyone want to ask about Yemen uh, or related topics? Yes. Oh, just quickly, what, what a message do you think um, that the sanctions today sent to Iran? Because uh, 
I believe Iran was mentioned in, in some of the, the documents and the, the ties to the, the Yemen figures and, and, and how does that conflict with Yemen and Saudi Arabia um, affect what you're uh, trying to do with Iran? Well, uh, look, um, what we said today in that statement uh, is that it is undeniable uh, that Iran has fanned the flames of conflict in Yemen. Uh, Iran has exacerbated tensions. Iran uh, has added to the already combustible uh, situation um, uh, that uh, has been ongoing in Yemen uh, for some time, threatening even greater uh, escalation, miscalculation, uh, regional uh, stability on Sarala, of course, relies on Iran uh, for uh, weapons, uh, for other uh, forms of support. Uh, and so when we have talked about our approach to Iran, um, we have uh, talked about the proposition that is on the table and has been on the table for quite some time when it comes to Iran's nuclear program. But we've also talked about that as a necessary but not sufficient element, um, because what the uh, first candidate Biden, now President Biden, has propositioned uh, is this so-called uh, compliance for compliance uh, prospect. The idea that Iran returns to compliance with the JCPOA, the United States uh, will uh, would do the same. We would then lengthen and strengthen uh, the that nuclear agreement, uh, but then use it, importantly here, as a platform to negotiate follow-on agreements that cover other areas of malign activity. And we've talked about Iran's ballistic missile program, but uh, clearly when it comes to Iran's uh, malign activity, we have to talk about Iran's uh, dangerous adventurism in the region. Uh, it is certainly an area uh, that we would seek to uh, address. It's certainly something that uh, we will address um, uh, going forward because it does add to the combustible situation uh, that we find ourselves with in Yemen. Uh, we'll move to Navalny unless... Uh, in, no, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, we see that Washington joined Europe in sanctioning Russia, but in, in difference with Europe. Uh, Euro European Union sanctioned only people in uniform, like special services, interior ministers, so on. You sanctioned, uh, I mean, uh, US leadership sanctioned uh, two guys directly from the Kremlin, from political leadership, Sergei Kiryanki and Andrei Yarin. Does it mean that Washington believes that political leadership, Kremlin, was in control of Navalny's fate? That it was not like excessive behavior of some, again, people in uniform? It's, yeah. And short second question. It was like pronounced that you did, that, that uh, sanctions were adopted in coordination with Europe. Uh, what do you expect in return, like to be on the same page on Nord Stream 2? Do you have any progress with Europe on Nord Stream 2 at all? Sure. Thank you. Uh, so let me take uh, your first question first. Um, of course, we have uh, worked closely um, with our European partners on the challenge of Russia since day one of this administration. Secretary Blinken, uh, President Biden uh, have had the opportunity to speak uh, on a bilateral basis uh, with a number of their counterparts uh, in Europe. Uh, Secretary Blinken, for his part, has uh, attended uh, virtually, of course, three meetings of uh, the E3 plus one uh, that included him. Uh, he uh, attended a meeting uh, with the Foreign Affairs Council, uh, uh, the EU FAC, uh, last Monday, I believe it was, in, in just about every one uh, of these engagements, uh, the issue of Russia um, uh, has come up. Uh, the issue of Mr. Navalny has been a constant topic of discussion bilaterally and in multilateral uh, uh, fora uh, between the United States uh, and our European uh, partners. Uh, that, uh, having said all that, um, the United States uh, and the EU and the UK, uh, we have different authorities. Uh, and so uh, the sanctions that uh, we announced today, the designations that we rolled out today, uh, they certainly complement, um, even if they may not be entirely identical uh, to what you have seen uh, from uh, the EU and from uh, the UK uh, in, in recent uh, months. But together, they send an un unambiguous signal uh, that the United States uh, is working closely with uh, our closest allies and partners uh, in Europe 
uh, to make clear that this kind of behavior is not acceptable. Uh, we will not countenance it. We will not tolerate it. Um, and there will be uh, penalties uh, going forward. Now, in terms of our sanctions today, we released a uh, a five-page uh, fact sheet from here that go through the various entities uh, that were uh, sanctioned. Uh, the Russian Federal Security Service, the FSB, um, was uh, among uh, those entities, including for um, the attempted assassination of uh, Mr. Navalny. So I think that speaks to um, uh, the other uh, element of your uh, question. Uh, remind me of your second question now. No, no, my actually question was, do you believe that political leadership is directly involved? Because we know, and uh, European Union decided as well, that Secret Service is involved. Do you think that Kremlin is involved? Well, uh, today we, among those entities uh, we sanctioned, uh, was the Russian Federal Security Service, the FSB. Um, and so I think that speaks to um, uh, where we believe culpability uh, lies. But I would need to refer you to the intelligence community for uh, a broader assessment of uh, that specific culpability. Second question was about, uh, do you expect something from Europe in return to, uh, with, uh, for this cooperation on, let's say, Nord Stream 2? Uh, so I've spoken to our coordination and our, our correspondence and communication uh, with Europe. Um, in a different context. Of course, we have had an opportunity uh, to speak to our European allies and our European partners uh, about the Nord Stream uh, 2 project, specifically uh, our profound concerns uh, with Nord Stream 2. President Biden, even before he assumed this high office, made very clear uh, his position that Nord Stream 2 is a bad deal. Um, it is an example of Russia's aggressive actions in the region, provides a means uh, for Russia to potentially uh, use a uh, critical natural resource for political pressure uh, and malign influence uh, in uh, the region. We will continue to work with uh, our allies and partners, including Germany, Ukraine, uh, other uh, European countries, to counter uh, Russian efforts uh, to undermine our uh, collective security. So we have made very clear uh, to our European partners across the continent uh, where we stand when it comes to Nord Stream 2, uh, and that, that hasn't changed. Simon? Uh, um, staying on Russia, um, the, the seven officials that you've sanctioned today, um, do you have any reason to believe that they have assets under U.S. jurisdiction? And, you know, whether that's the case or not, what makes you believe that Russia is going to change its behavior because of these, you know, these latest sanctions? The EU had already delivered sanctions in October, and that's even before he was arrested. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why do, why do you think that this is going to trigger a behavior change that, that hasn't happened already? Well, we announced these actions today uh, to make clear uh, that uh, with the poisoning, the attempted assassination of Mr. Navalny, with his continued uh, imprisonment that is politically motivated, uh, with the, uh, in some cases, brutal treatment of his supporters who took to the streets uh, to uh, exercise the very rights that are granted to them under Russia's own constitution, uh, that is not something that the United States will abide. Uh, it is not something that our European partners and allies will abide. Uh, as you mentioned, there were sanctions uh, both on, from both sides uh, of the Atlantic today. Um, our sanctions uh, were significant. Uh, Europe's actions were significant. Uh, taken together, uh, this is a sizable penalty um, for Russia. It is a sizable penalty to which Russia uh, was not subject prior to today. With these actions, the United States um, uh, in many ways caught up uh, to uh, where Europe had been. Because as you said, uh, Europe announced uh, measures last October. Um, with our measures today, uh, we are bringing our actions uh, very closely in line uh, with what our European partners uh, had already uh, spoken to. Uh, so when the United States and Europe um, act uh, in conjunction with one another, when we both take uh, steps to impose these costs, uh, those costs will be noticed in Moscow. Um, and uh, it will also be noticed that the international community is standing up um, to underscore a norm that chemical weapons uh, cannot uh, ever be used anytime, any place, and by anyone. Um, that is a clear signal that we sought to send today um, with our closest allies uh, and partners. And what about on the issue of, of assets, though? Do you have reasons? I, uh, you, I would need to refer to Treasury if there are specific uh, assets. Um, more on Russia? Yes. Yeah, just following up on I'll come, um, come right to you. Uh, <coughs> you, you 
mentioned several times from the podium that you want to work with allies and partners to stop Russia from building the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Of course, Germany is a partner of Russia's in building that pipeline and disagrees with your efforts to, to stop that pipeline from being built. So the first question is, how do you square your desire to work with allies and partners when the key ally in this case, Germany, fundamentally disagrees with you on whether that pipeline should go ahead? And second, would the U.S. be prepared to sanction German entities such as Nord Stream 2, the company, which is undeniably actually building the pipeline? Thanks. What we have said, um, and we have made very clear uh, to partners all across Europe, um, whether those uh, are, whether that's Ukraine, uh, whether it's uh, uh, Poland, whether it's others, whether it's Germany, um, that the United States has profound concerns uh, with this uh, pipeline. It is a uh, bad deal. It is not only in the interest of the United States, uh, it also runs contrary to Europe's own stated energy goals. Now, um, uh, we have uh, engaged in good faith um, with our uh, German partners. We continue uh, to discuss this with them to make clear where the United States uh, stands. Um, uh, we announced, we uh, submitted a report to uh, Congress just a few days ago uh, with additional action against uh, KVT Rus, uh, an entity which we had identified um, as uh, taking part in sanctionable activity. We are continuing uh, to evaluate the entities involved in this uh, Nord Stream 2 project. I believe it is that uh, we owe a report to Congress every 90 days. The next report will be due to Congress uh, in May, I believe it is. Uh, and so in between now and May, if we have uh, additional information that uh, meets the, the threshold uh, for enacting sanctions, uh, I expect we will be informing Congress of that. Just to quick follow up, would the U.S. be prepared to sanction German entities like Nord Stream 2? I mean, it's, its involvement in this pipeline is, you know, on its face, pretty obvious. We, we are prepared to uphold our legal and policy commitments. I wouldn't want to get uh, ahead of that. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, I, I, I promised I'd come back to you. Yes. Thank you, Matt. Yes. Uh, this is a question for a coworker who are not able to be here on Russia. So there were uh, there are eight names uh, that were not sanctioned today by the U.S., but who were requested by Navalny's uh, team in January. Is there a reason why? Mm -hmm. Well, U.S. sanctions, uh, uh, we have a certain threshold. We have certain requirements that we must meet uh, in order to um, sanction a particular individual or entity. Uh, so in the first instance, we have to satisfy our own criteria uh, when it comes to enacting uh, sanctions. We uh, took a close look at the available information, the available evidence, drawing on public sources, drawing on uh, sources that are unique to the United States government. And the target set that we sanctioned today, those are the targets that are consistent with our obligations under uh, the various laws and executive orders to enact sanctions. Thank you. Well, Can I ask? Would you say that that information that you use to do that is, is equivalent or roughly the same as the same? intelligence information that linked uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to the murder of Jamal Khashoggi? I, I wouldn't want to characterize an intelligence assessment uh, from here. Uh, yes. Uh, just following on those two questions and the, and the question about the deterrence effect of today's sanctions, um, is it then the, the fact that those the names of oligarchs uh, that Navalny's foundation had identified as saying would really have the, the only true way to effectuate change from the regime in Russia? Um, does, does this mean that going forward then that those names would be, or that the U.S. has made a determination that those names aren't necessarily subject subject to American sanctions? Uh, what we announced today uh, was a discrete set of actions. Uh, I certainly don't expect that what we announced today was the totality uh, of our efforts to hold Russia to account going forward uh, for its human rights abuses. As I was uh, mentioning before, we have certain thresholds and criteria we have to satisfy under executive orders, uh, under uh, law, in order to enact sanctions. If uh, we determine that uh, it is in our interest to pursue uh, designations against additional targets for human rights violations, whether it's in the case of Mr. Navalny, whether it's in the case of uh, Russia's uh, broader uh, conduct, um, we'll have to meet those thresholds. And if we do, and if it's our interest, in our interest, I expect you'll be hearing more about uh, potential um, policy responses uh, to that. Yes. 
Uh, on Iran, uh, what is your next step on Iran? Will you be waiting for them to come to the table? You will p uh, put more pressure on them, sanctions? Uh, what, what's next? Well, I think, as I said yesterday, when it comes to Iran, uh, we remain willing uh, to re-engage in meaningful diplomacy. Uh, to help bring about a mutual return to compliance with uh, the JCPOA uh, commitments. Uh, we plan to be in close contact with our P5 uh, plus one counterparts, certainly uh, our European um, partners that uh, uh, entail the P5 uh, plus one. Um, we have made our position quite clear now for some time. Uh, we are prepared to meet with Iran to address the way forward uh, on a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. We also know that, that a mutual return to compliance uh, can't happen without all sides engaging in constructive diplomacy. For our part, that constructive diplomacy uh, will be uh, carefully coordinated with our European partners and allies. It'll be principled, it will be clear-eyed, uh, and it will be in pursuit of one aim, uh, and that is to ensure and to see to it that Iran can never acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, and to apply verifiable limits to Iran's nuclear program. Will there be any meeting with the Europeans or uh, other partners to discuss this? Or? Well, we're going to coordinate closely uh, with the uh, P3 uh, and with the P5 plus one more broadly on uh, the way forward. Uh, as we've said, and we spent the first uh, several weeks of the administration doing just this, uh, consulting closely with allies, with partners, with members of Congress, all three of those are very important uh, to us. Uh, we're not going to do anything um, without that close coordination with all three of those elements. Um, if uh, it's in our determination that there is a better way forward to engage uh, in that dialogue uh, with Iran together with our partners and allies, as I, as I said yesterday, uh, we're not dogmatic about uh, the format. What we are dogmatic about uh, is our ultimate objective, and that is to ensure that Iran can never acquire a nuclear weapon. Michael. Uh, Ned, do you agree with the Iranian position that Iran was in compliance with the agreement when the Trump administration, when President Trump left the agreement? And if so, then what is your response to the Iranian position that the U.S. should undo that Trump action and then move forward from there? My, my response is precisely what I just said. The United States uh, has put a path forward really in two meaningful ways, one strategic and one tactical. Uh, the strategic way is what we have refer referred to is compliance for compliance. If Iran resumes full compliance with the JCPOA, we will be prepared to do the same. We will meet our commitments under the JCPOA. The tactical uh, proposition we put forward uh, is precisely what we said, what, a couple weeks ago now, that uh, if the EU were to broker a meeting, uh, we would be willing to attend together with our uh, European partners and allies. Again, we think that uh, resumption of compliance, compliance for compliance, can't happen without all sides uh, discussing those details. That's what we put on the table. That's what we remain, uh, uh, we remain ready to engage in. And uh, any movement on the South Korean uh Iranian assets, any further conversations or anything to report on whether they might be unfrozen? I, I, would, I would put that in the context of things we would want to discuss uh, in the context of prospective talks with the Iranians. Um, again, we're not dogmatic about the format. We are dogmatic about other elements, including our overriding objective uh, in this. Sure. Israel has blamed Iran for the attack on its ship in, in the Gulf. Do you have anything on this? I'm sorry, with its... Oh, the ship in the Gulf. Um, uh, so, uh, yes, certainly um, uh, we're, we are calling for an investigation um, uh, into that. I would uh, need to refer you to Israeli authorities, though, uh, for their assessment. I just don't have anything to add from here. Can we move on to Haiti? Sure. Um, given the current political instability in Haiti, would the State Department recommend the Biden administration to continue giving TPS, temporary protected status to Haitians who have been seeking refuge in the U.S. since the uh, 2010 earthquake. Thank you. Well, by law, TPS des designations are made by the Department of Homeland Security after consultation with the uh, appropriate agencies. Uh, so we wouldn't want to comment on any sort of internal deliberations when uh, it comes to TPS. Can you comment on the political instability there Currently, uh, do you think there will be more asylum seekers? 
Well, on with the situation broadly, uh, what I would say is that it is the responsibility of Haiti's government to organize elections in 2021 that are free, that are fair, uh, that are credible. Uh, we join the international community in calling Haitian stakeholders to come together to find a way forward. Uh, what we have said is that uh, the Haitian people deserve the opportunity to elect their leaders and to restore Haiti's democratic institutions. Uh, if we have more on TPS, we'll be uh, certain to uh, let you know. Anything uh, else, Francisco? Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia. Yeah. Uh, so we saw the readout of the secretary's call with the prime minister. Can you confirm that the U.S. government has reached its own assessment that there is a campaign of ethnic cleansing uh, ongoing in Tigray, and did the secretary raise this with the prime minister? And also, did he raise the detention of several, at least four journalists and translators working for several medias, uh, including AFP, BBC, or Financial Times? Well, we issued a rather lengthy readout of the secretary's uh, call this morning. Uh, what I would say is that we are gravely concerned by reported atrocities uh, in the overall deteriorating situation in, in the Tigray. Uh, region of Ethiopia. We strongly condemn the killings, the forced removals and displacement, uh, the sexual assaults, uh, and other human rights violations and abuses uh, by several parties and multiple uh, that multiple organizations now uh, have uh, reported uh, in Tigray. Um, when it comes to the detention of the journalists that you mentioned, we're following uh, those reports closely. We've been in touch uh, with the Ethiopian Broadcasting Authority and other Ethiopian government officials to express our concern uh, and to seek an explanation. Uh, these actions appear inconsistent uh, with the Ethiopian government's commitment to permit international media access to Tigray. But you wouldn't Verbal? characterize it as a ethnic cleansing campaign? Uh, look, if we, I have said we're gravely concerned uh, by it. If we have uh, more to add, uh, I will, I will let you know. I heard Burma. Um, let's uh, be sure to cover that before we, before we close. Sure. Uh, the situation with the uh, ambassador to the United Nations. Granted, he presents his credentials to the Secretary General, not to the U.S. government per se. But it's been reported that he is insisting that he is the representative of Burma or Myanmar at the United Nations, not the uh, deputy at the mission, and that apparently he has sent a letter to the Secretary of State indicating that he's standing firm, that he is not going along with the uh, junta in uh, Nepal. What is the building's understanding of the situation uh, in Burma? What is the understanding about the situation with its diplomats in this country? Is the U.S. prepared to provide uh, refuge to any of these people if they may be running afoul of the junta? Well, uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, uh, UN Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, others in the United States government uh, last week, last Friday, I believe it was, commended uh, the courageous statements made uh, by permanent representative Ja Modun. Um, uh, we uh, collectively have uh, commended uh, the bravery uh, shown um, by the permanent representative uh, during her own remarks uh, at the General Assembly uh, moments later. When it comes to um, uh, Jamo Dunn, we understand the permanent rep representative remains uh, in uh, his uh, position. Um, I, I, again, I think generally we continue to stand uh, with the people of Burma. We continue to work with the international community, especially uh, our like-minded allies and partners uh, around the world to signal very clearly, both in word uh, and in deed, and we've talked about deeds uh, in recent days, uh, that we will stand by the people of Burma. Uh, we will continue to oppose the military uh, coup, and we will continue to support the restoration of Burma's democratically elected uh, civilian government going forward. Has uh, this building had any direct uh, contact with Burmese or Myanmar officials, with their ambassador, for example, to express your deep concern about the political situation in that country? Uh, so as diplomats, um, 
uh, individuals in this building speak with a wide range of people and their representatives wherever uh, they are in the world. In Burma um, in particular, it's important that we speak with all of those who seek to restore democracy in the country, uh, including uh, those whom the people of Burma uh, democratically elected to serve as their uh, representative. Uh, representatives. Um, I'll take one final question here. Syria. Uh, thank you. Um, a couple of days ago, uh, a New York Times article highlighted that the only country in Idlib uh, protecting civilians uh, from being slaughtered by uh, Assad regime and Russian, its Russian and uh, Iranian backers is Turkey. So, and uh, by the way, I'm, I remember your statement yesterday about you know Turkish soldiers you know martyred in Idlib last year. Thank you. So considering the civilians over there, uh, is there any chance that the uh, Biden administration might be working with Turkey when it comes to Idlib? Thank you. When it comes to Idlib? Idlib, yes. Uh, look, what we have said is that uh, we certainly have common interests uh, with our Turkish partners. You mentioned uh, the statement that uh, we put out uh, last night about the anniversary of the uh, horrific loss of, uh, of, of Turkish personnel. Um, uh, we have shared interests with Turkey um, specifically uh, on, uh, on when it comes uh, to Syria. Um, we will continue to work with uh, Turkey um, and to work constructively um, with Turkey uh, to um, achieve uh, our uh, common interests when it comes to Syria uh, going forward. Thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow. Take this if you don't, and I don't know if you all have an answer. Are you aware of this uh, letter, a reported letter that was written, a joint letter from Fatah and Hamas to NEA, to Hadi Amr about, uh, are you aware of this one? Have you seen it too? And do you have any response to it? Uh, we, we, I'm aware of the reports. Um, I don't have anything for you today though. Thank you very much. Okay.